Hey everybody, I'm Angela Lee Chen. Most of you know me. Um, welcome. Welcome to the 13th annual general meeting. This is our third here in this space, so a very proud achievement for this organization. So September 2005, Katrina slammed into the New Orleans area. And, uh, and shortly after that, we started gathering, small group of us, at Jerry Edwards' house. And um, not sure the week or the day there, but it was in September 2005. Yeah. Yeah. And that began the, um, what became the Circle of Friends. That was our Mayor Baba's Circle of Friends. It started out as the Grand Strand Mayor Baba group. And um, Jerry was one of the founding members way back when. And Shirley was there too. Yeah. And in 2006, you went down to New Orleans, New Orleans yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, to do a concert and to start the uh, New Orleans Baba Group, was it? No, we, to start the Baba Group. Start the Baba Group. Yeah. yeah and we, we ended up playing also. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll let you talk I'll more about, about that. Yeah. Tell you more about that. So we have a little honorary plaque here. President Emeritus Sempiternum in recognition of his unparalleled role in founding, sustaining, and delivering soul and song with Avatar Mayor Baba's Circle of Friends, the Circle Board proudly confers upon A. Gerald Edwards. Got the name right. <laughs> the title of President, President Emeritus Sempiternum. With all wow. the honor, appreciation, and deference thereunto pertaining, done this day, December 8th, 2018. Thank you. So I think Jerry might have a few words. I don't think, I don't think most people know about the, the formation of the uh, Baba group in, uh, in uh, New Orleans. But, um, we flew down, I was had my plane and we were flying, and Ambika, Sherla, and myself flew down with our instruments and Bobby Bernstein's piano. <laughs> and uh, we landed in New Orleans and we ended up playing a Citroen Bistro. Uh, it's on a, a Orange Avenue and Religious Street down there. So it's, it's a sort of significant. But anyway, I met this guy, Joe Burke. He was given a phone number, <laughs> met him. And uh, he had an amazing story. He had Baba pictures and everything all over his place. And the flood came in, it stopped the floor level. Never went above the floor level. So all the Baba stuff stayed dry. And uh, this guy was go going down the street, saw him and said, hey, they're gonna need cleaning. He gave him, well, on consignment, he gave him a cleaning rig in a trailer with the power washers and everything. And because he had no way of earning a living because he was out of work just like a lot of people were there. He was a jobber and sold t-shirts and stuff like that. So um, they gave him that and he said, you know, use it and when you get some money, send me some. So he said, okay. So he did, he started cleaning banks and stores and things like that, and he felt that this was given to him from Baba. So he said, I gotta de devote uh, one night a week, Monday he did, to the um, Ninth Ward. That's where, where the accident was. The barge had hit the, the wall, I went and saw the spot, and all the water came through and flooded those houses, which the musicians owned, by the way. They weren't rented houses, they were owned mostly. And uh, there was a group that came also, uh, the college freshmen, you know, who uh, took the, the um, uh, spring break. Mm -hmm. They went down there, they had an organization, I think it was called Common Ground. And they would put on these hazmat suits and go cleaning the area and build special houses. They were, had a grant for that, that, that were waterproof and all, or high on stilts and stuff. And they were fooling around with that. And, and they got it going, they got the people back up. And I remember we went to the jazz concert, because that's what we went for. 
also all had all of those things together. And um, one of the groups got up and said, we had no way of earning a living, it was a whole family. And they bought instruments for him. Saxophone, piano, I think trombone, and a couple of others. And they had enough money to buy them and got them back on the stage so they were able to earn a living again. I thought it was a really nice thing. And uh, the amical fluidist, she was playing her flute at the time. <laughs> we had a nice jam session at the club. And uh, Joe Burke and I still keep in touch. We were down there on my honeymoon and, and we had a band with a, a trumpet and a flugelhorn was a leader. Okay, trumpet, flugelhorn. Most people don't know what a flugelhorn is. But if you want to know, you can ask me. Thank you. <laughs> Thirteen years, heart, sweat, and soul. Can we give him a, a bigger round of applause? <laughs> and now, I get to give my president's report. In a world of happy, do it in short, as if you were not doing it at all, but as if I or God were doing it through you. Avatar Mirababa on work, quoted in Practical Spirituality. I'm told that this place was once a dress barn. In my mind's eye, I can see a room of many colors adorned throughout in patterns bold, pretty, and panchromatic. And the people coming in to buy every and anything from the practical to the preposterous pleased by it all. Well now, it's his home in the mall and our niche for light. Yet I delight to say not much has changed in this place. For now, we come for goodies too. And from the cerebral blue of the multi-textured Newell or Ott lectures on Baba's manifestation to the red-throated hallelujahs of the True Light Gospel Choir 2018 has supplied them in abundance. Every color, cut, and hem of education, inspiration, art, meditation, fellowship, celebration, even mourning. Peace be unto you, Jack, and Maureen, and Naomi, and Mary. We have had them all. More than 308 separate ventures into community and individual edification, many recorded for all time on YouTube. From exploring the language of love to la lengua de español, the Circle Center has evolved full dimensional into a world all its own. No longer experimental or even novel, this place is now as natural and easy as your local coffee shop, but quite more intriguing. We even have our regulars, Drumming from the Heart, Far Side and Circle Cinema, Hoffitt Study Group, Effort and Grace, Light Meditation and Heavy Casino. <laughs> our world, too, is getting larger as we draw others from the Ukes of NMB and Zonta Club of Myrtle Beach to Phoenix Renaissance and St. Francis in the Dunes. And we brim with hope that more will happen in this arc as our niche for light becomes a grand beacon to those whom we might befriend and serve. As to the state of the circle of friends, I augur our 13th year to be a lucky one. Our board is full, capable, and strong. Our reserve fund has finally entered don't worry, be happy territory. And we move into the future with mission undimmed to remember Avatar Mirababa through love, fellowship, and service to one and all. But most and utmost, we fain offer all we have and all we do and all we've done to our compassionate Father who is the paint, palette, and point of it all and in whose kaleidoscopic work we are ever blessed to share. Or as Gerard Manley Hopkins once wrote, he fathers forth whose beauty is past change, 
Praise Him. Thank you. Santa Claus is coming to town. Santa Claus is coming to town. Santa Claus is coming to town. He knows if you are sleeping. He knows if you're awake. He knows if you've been fed or good, so good for goodness sake. Oh, you better watch out. You better not cry. You better not cry. I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming to town. Santa Claus is coming to town. Chuck Berry's uh, cousin on um, slide trombone here, Keith Berry. Uh, Ackford on uh, drums, and my name is Jerry Edwards. Everybody knows that by now. Merry Christmas, Baba. Well, you should have treated me nice. Well, you should have seen tonight. Gave me Paris out for Christmas. Now I'm living in paradise.
Amazon Blue. All right, everyone. Thank you again for joining us this evening. We have a very, three very special guests coming from Asheville, as you know. They're part of the Mac group, so we're going to find out this evening who Mac is. Just like uh, everyone to give them a big round of applause. It's very impressive what they've been able to pull off. They were able to fund it by uh, turning half of their facility already into a microbrewery. So, <laughs> some creative financing. Keep that in mind, Dennis. Um, so let's get started here, Mr. Hugh Huntington. Um, well, I'm Hugh Huntington. I'm one of the board members of Mayhair Archive Collective. <laughs> That's the shh. Um, there are there are four of the board members. Uh, Scott Towers here tonight. He's standing over here. Um, Ken Blackman, Huberley, or Jean Ludwig, depending on how you know her. And um, did I say Renee? Don't leave out. Okay, Renee Percentage. Um, and then Eric Adams is our executive director. And so the six of us meet weekly and hammer out through all sorts of stuff we never anticipated. So, um, we're going to talk in three terms tonight. I'm going to talk a little bit about the history, just very briefly skim across it. Uh, Eric will be talking second about uh, archiving, what we're doing, opportunities that we have. And Scott's going to talk about this incredible building that we purchased a few months ago and what's happening there now. So, let's talk about uh, history. Um, at the Southeast Gathering um, two years ago, two and a half years ago, Clive Adams cornered Ken and myself and Dan Sparks, um, and we started talking about archiving, what was needed. And those of you who know Clive know he's really big on we need more archiving done. Um, so uh, Clive went back to California, and Ken and I started pushing the process and hooked up with Erich and Seven McCauley. And, Eric and Seven called a meeting, a little Sunday afternoon gathering, and the enthusiasm was just overwhelming. Uh, I think within a week or ten days, we had formed a committee, developed a mission statement, and our mission statement is, as you see here, to collect, preserve, and share Mayhair Baba's divine legacy of materials, artifacts, and words with integrity, love, and transparency for the benefit of humanity. We're, we're really focusing on the technology side. There's all the preserving and all that's got to be done, but we want to take it into um, a research format. It's a long, long bit of work to be done, but that's where we want to go with it so that the world can access it from wherever. Um, so that's what we're shooting for, and that's, and that's why the statement there, benefit of humanity. All right, so after we formed the mission statement, uh, we started working together and figuring out what we're going to do. We got some free space to meet. Um, we quickly outgrew that. It was small and we started getting some equipment and started doing some scanning and um, Elaine Cox moved down from New Jersey and suddenly our meeting space got crammed into the little office space. And so all that work really began and we've just been pushing the seams that we're, like, we're talking about, all right, what are we going to do? So we went through a visioning process, and we came up with, if we could have our ideal now, what would it be? And it would be 3,000 square feet. And we said, okay, but let's build it so that we can expand it so it becomes more community-oriented, meeting rooms for the community, et cetera. What would that in, in look like? And we decided 8,000 feet was what we would want. And so we knew we weren't going to get it right now because our architect, Ty Provosky, said, if you're going to do an archive building properly in this country, you're going to have $275 to $350 a square foot. Put that times 3000 and you got between $750 and a million dollars. Okay? We're like, wow. Okay, well, now let's go looking for a piece of land. We found a piece. Didn't quite suit, but it was available at a really bargain price. And and all of a sudden this thing called Red Oak School shows up. Mm -hmm. And it's a big building, it's 25,000 square feet. Wow. And 
what we decided we wanted to be able to do with it eventually, and there was a lot of skepticism, but we really studied the building. We got Peter Nordine to go through that building top to bottom, type of velocity, went through it top to bottom, and he has a lot of experience with overhauling old large buildings as a part of his architectural background. And it just kept growing on us. And I'll tell you, I was the, I think I was the last skeptic on the board. Maybe a couple of others might argue with me, but I just, I finally reached the place where it was like, this is just going to happen. And I've got a background in commercial buildings, and I know what it's like to maintain old buildings. And I just couldn't say no. And so we went for it. Um, we initially had a, uh, had a price of 725000 realized because of the short time we had to raise money, we weren't going to hit that target. The kind of monies we are trying to raise should take a year of planning before you go to buy your building. Well, we did it backwards. We built the building and started looking for money. We were a little short. We negotiated the price down to five fifty. So we took uh, one hundred seventy-five thousand dollars out of the price. So um, that's what we have done with the building. Um, I want to talk about a couple other things. Um, I want to tell you a funny story about the five hundred one C three. Went to North Carolina to get that. Turned that in North Carolina. There's only one person who approves it. It doesn't take a big committee. There are no laws or rules. One person approves it. So I wrote it up, sent it all in. We're all about Mayor Baba. He was this, that, and the other. And we had documents, etc. She felt nervous, as we found out later, and talked to the one of the attorneys there. And he said, well, it looks like they're just collecting papers to decline the request. Oh, that gum. Boy, that's weird. I thought, well, I'm in the Bible Belt. Maybe that's what triggered it. <laughs> Ken Blackman said, well, the Catholic Church does the same thing. I thought, all right. So I called her, got her on the phone, and I said, you know, the Catholic Church collected a lot of documents in the name of Jesus, and we're collecting a lot of documents in the name of Mary Baba, another spiritual leader, and I think we ought to qualify. Two days later, we had the approval. <laughs> so, Jesus was working for us that day. <laughs> um, as, as we've developed and, and learned how to start working the whole notion of an additional archive in the Bible community, we've really come to understand that if we as a community don't take this on as a oneness orientation, then we're going to fall short. There's, there's such a huge amount of work to be done, and I appreciated that, I thought, on the front end until we started getting our first collections. The amount of time it takes to take a single document, and you've got to work the crease out of it to preserve it properly, and you've got to work with white gloves, and you dust it with a brush, and then you flip it over, and you dust it again, and you flip it back, and you stick it in a preservative sheath of some sort. And that's after it's all been organized in catalog, and then it goes off to be scanned, and upload it in the computer, and the scanning is not just a picture of it. It's, we look at it and say, who is it from and who is it to? What was the date? Where were they? Went from here to there. What's the subject matter? And some of these documents have multiple subject matters. Some mention a few names. Some mention things as simple as a flip chart stand. Okay, well, so we have to sort through and work out all that data. And Eris and I chatted briefly, briefly a while ago about um, how much time it takes per average document. Simple documents don't take a lot, but we're thinking between 20 minutes and an hour on the, tip of, on the typical stuff we're working with. So we get, thank you, Jerry. <laughs> so so we, get a, we get a collection that's got 500 documents. What are you talking, 250, 350 hours? And that's just on one collection. So if you use that as an example, to think how much work we've got to do and how much volunteer time we need to be able to get all that done. If we don't take a oneness orientation between all the archives sitting on this globe, we're going to fall short of getting it done. So that's our primary orientation with this. We don't see any place for competition and no place for exclusivity. If we're not working the heart and the mind piece of this thing, it's just going to fall short. It's not going to be up to the quality that it could be. We won't get the work done. 
we're open to working with other archives that have help, and we've reached out for that. Had one project going, but that had some understanding, I won't say disagreement, it's just something we felt like we needed to have, and wasn't there, so that project came to a stop. But we're open to, we want to demonstrate this is not about Asheville having its own collection. It's about Asheville doing the work to get this stuff up on the web so the world can see it. And if we can help the trust, and they got a project, and we got the time, let's help the trust. Let's put it all up on the web. Let's give it back to them, they put it on theirs, we put it on ours, it goes up on the web. So the world can find this stuff. So that's the fundamental way we've chosen to operate and make our decisions. <clears throat> so, I want to talk about how it is we want to work with anybody who's got a collection that they're not sure what they want to do with it. We'll do three things with it. The typical is give it to us, we preserve it, keep it forever. All right, it's got your name on it, you have, some con you have control over, do all those documents but never put this one up on the web. Okay, so you've got control of what it is that we would do with your material. The second is that we will do your work, do the scanning, and if you really need it back, you can have it back. But they'll see we've got it scanned and ready to go up on the up to the world. So the actual holding of it is not as significant to us as how do we get it up and show it to the world. And the third way we will do it is you come to us and we'll teach you how to do it. And you do your own. We'll ask you please let us scan, but it's yours. So we'll do any of those three things, and that's our orientation with it. All right, um, Eric, um, you want to talk about what we're doing, and then Scott will follow on. Um, a lot of people think an archive is a, is a nice big room that's safe, kind of like a bank vault. But actually, it's, that's just one piece of an archive. Uh, an archive, ideally, is a working space. So aside from just having a, a safe space, th this is kind of what we do. This is a general, you know, some things there's less of it and some things there's more. But, you know, there's a whole phase of surveying, which is going out there, finding, does, is there a collection, or, or where did so-and-sos, you know, we see films of them with Baba, we knew there was correspondence, but where the heck is all that stuff? So it might be asking, you know, people in India or people in Middle Beach where something is. So that's just one piece of it. Uh, planning and assessment might be, all right, now you've given us this stuff. How much of it is unique? You know, how much of it do we really need to work and to scan? And how much of it maybe is a, a circular or perhaps a book that's already up on the web, that's already in India or, or somewhere else? So kind of a, that prioritization of what, and then, wow, this is an original handwritten document, and Bob assigned it. You know, that's, that's when you're like, ooh, this is like finding treasure, you know. So assessing any kind of collection <coughs> is a big part of <coughs> what you do. Um, and what we call rehousing. A lot of people haven't heard that term. That's the, the thing that he was explaining with the, the dusting, the full, uh, folding out creases, basically setting it up in a way so that it'll last a long time. Because uh, what we found with a number of collections, things were sent, folded up, and inside an envelope. And that's a great way to keep track of it. You know, what the date was and all this, except it destroys that document over time. It'll fall apart right along all the folds and the creases. And actually, I'll, <coughs> I'll show you later, but even the type of paper that things were written on or preserved with, sometimes people would send a, uh, a newspaper clipping with a letter, and you can see a dark shape wherever the newspaper, the acids in that paper and the ink were touching the page. So different things like that. Um, rehousing it is removing paper clips, which are mostly rusty by now. If, they're, if they were there in the 50s or 60s, you know, there's a careful way to do it and, and putting those things away. Digitization is a whole other phase. We actually have different people to do that, and that, that might be running a scanner. Uh, but there's more to that than you'd think. A lot of people, you know, take a quick photo with their phone and then put it on Facebook and they're like, well, I'm done. There's my archiving. It's all ready. The problem with that is you could never print that out again and have a duplicate of what the original looked like. Even though it looks kind of nice on your screen, Facebook likes to shrink and dumb things down just enough to where it's not archived. It's not like a safe copy. So one of the big things that 
our primary goal is to <coughs> work cooperatively, as Hugh said, with whoever, if it's an archive or a center or individuals, to, as close as we can, gather a complete record of the avatar. You know, that means all the correspondence, all the books, and even the manuscripts are the earlier editions. You know, a lot of books have already been edited multiple times, and that's fine. But it's just, imagine if we had draft one of the Bible, and then draft eight of the Bible, and in, then, you know, the one 200 years later, and you could see all the things that changed over time. You know, we actually have that capability in the sense, whatever our Bible is, I don't know, but, you know, you might say, early drafts of Lord Mayhair or early drafts of the discourses and um, it's all within our power to, you know, and a lot of it has been preserved. But there's even notes and dialogues back and forth about how these decisions were made. You know, the Don Stevens archive is a wonderful back and forth with Mani and Don about, you know, edits and notes about, well, Baba wants this, you know, so you have these great records of how these, these seminal works came to be. And to gather that complete record and keep it stored strategically, you know, around the world. And, and so you have to kind of get beyond ownership to do that. You have to, you know, like have a copy, even if it's a digital copy, uh, you know, in India and in Australia and in Myrtle Beach and Asheville and wherever, Los Angeles, all the different places where there's Baba centers. Because if you, if you really study history, you know, over the hundreds of years and the thousands of years, things that people probably thought were very safe ended up not being because massive records got lost. Um, the Library of Alexandria is a great example where everything was in one house and that house burned down <laughs> and all the, the best knowledge of the time was just gone. And, you know, and there were copies of copies and, uh, and the originals and the recent copy, everything went up. So that's, that's a good thing to learn from, I think. Um, and, then, and then there's a whole other part of just sharing, how to share. That could be a website. You know, for us, we're going to try to get as much as we can available for researchers. Probably some more will be available locally to, in our research library. You know, some things might not be appropriate for the web, or we'll have copies of rare books that we're not going to republish on, online. Um, but there'll be a place where people can come, and they can actually look at some of the originals, and they can look at digital copies. Um, so that's kind of the big gist of it. So I'm going to take you just through a little bit of something fun that I like to do, which is archiving and just working with bodies images. Because it, it's almost like a meditation. You can just put on some music, or you can put on a recording of Mondali, and just, it's, for me, it's a bit like a meditation. Now, some of these are going to be from different collections. I'm not even saying, you know, we hold copyright over them, but for one reason or another, we were given collections, we were given permission. So for instance, you know, this image was in the Jean Adriel collection, which was given to my mother for, for one reason or another. But probably originally the Jean Adriel photos came from Elizabeth Patterson, who was taking most of the, the yeah. pictures of Bob at that time. So, um, so this is an example where, this is from the wedding of Eric Shesawala. And there are two photos. I'll show you the next one. But both of them are kind of, there's sort of an outtake here because Bob is closing his eyes. Even though everyone else looks great, and they're in focus. And this one, Bob's closing his eyes. And in the next one, Bob looks great. But for some reason, the focus is very soft on the edges. You can see the edge and the bottom looks great. But it's because it's blurry on the edges, it's, you know, maybe not the one that you would frame either. And so I just... You know, you, just by doing different kinds of things like cropping or sometimes straightening, you can completely change the context of the photo. And this has been happening since the beginning. If you look at old book photos and jewelry and whatever, 90% of the time it was a cropped, much larger photo from a different perspective. Sometimes you can do, you know, use it as inspiration for different things, covers, CDs. Now, this is an example of very interesting. For me at the time I saw this, I hadn't seen it before, even though you can find copies of it here and there. But I was I was given a scan of this, pretty high resolution, but it had a number of you know defects, it had a tear, some creases, and um, it's also a good example of, of what we find in the archiving world today, where 
this didn't come from the person who maybe the Mondali gave it to. It was already passed down. Uh, this was from the Nadine Tolstoy collection, who probably got it from Mani or someone over there. <coughs> and then she probably left it to Norina, who then left it to Elizabeth, who then left it to Jane Haynes. And now this particular print is, in, is owned by Charles Haynes, who's the one who shared it with me. <coughs> so you can kind of see. It was just, it probably, I, I, I imagine this was in her wallet and she carried it with her everywhere she went. And so this is after spending a lot of time with it and just, as I said, it was kind of a meditation, just kind of working out the creases in Photoshop and kind of taking the aged coloration and playing with it a little bit. And then that's, that's a sort of comparison. Now, so this was years ago. This is before Mac actually started. And it was one of the first ones I was playing with. <clears throat> and then, so here's what happens in the archiving world. Within the last six months, I think Scott and I were looking at the Fredella photo collection, and we found a wonderfully clean copy. <laughs> but it's still different. You know, in a way, I look at them as two different images right. just because of the, the other one had that, it somehow retained the character of sitting in Nadine's wallet for who knows how many decades. You know? hmm. Yeah, but there was a great, very clean copy in the Fredella collection. It was inside of an envelope and just kept it very clean. So here's another example of something similar. This was from Gene Adriel's photos. It was one of the only ones that had a, had a rip in it. There is and, a better version of that. Yeah, and I know there are better, but just as an example, uh, and this is probably originally taken by Elizabeth as well. But the kind of things you can do. So this one I was just doing today, actually. and I, So the crease, the rip is sort of gone, sort of massaged out using some Photoshop tools. And then this is straightened. You know, a lot of times you don't notice, but the whole thing is crooked for some reason. And there's a line, so you can just straighten it. Now it looks almost like a different photo. And then just by, you know, you can change the context in different ways by zooming in. Now this one was a little too far away to get a crisp picture of Baba, but it's an interesting time. You can get a closer up of, of you know, Jean Adriel there, the lower, see middle, the and down, see Margaret. This is another interesting thing you'll find in archives if you look. Now, the, the part on the right that says the burden seems almost too great. What that is is a handwritten note by Jean Adriel. And quite a few of her photos just have little narrations or observations. Sometimes there's a date if you're lucky. You know, there's another one of, of Baba <coughs> with Kitty, and Kitty's trying to hold the umbrella and she can't keep up with Baba and something about Kitty it looks like she's having an out-of-body experience and so there's some comment from Jean like you know Kitty Davy apparently in the, from the astral plane or something like that. so there are these funny little anecdotes on the back of her photos so the other so photos are a lot of fun and, and you know you got to be more careful with them and um, but the other kinds of things that you tend to find are letters manuscripts sometimes you know books that were later published that we don't know if it's the same version or not, but uh, or something somebody was working on that never got published. A lot of telegrams, circulars are what they would kind of, one person would send it to somebody and they were expected to, a group head, and they were expected to disseminate either the whole thing or sometimes portions of it to specific people. <coughs> a lot of greeting cards, postcards, and all that sort of stuff. Um, here's an example of yeah, these aerograms. Um, this is Mara writing to Ella, Beryl, Adele, Liz, and Anne. And you find that a lot. And there's quite a few letters in the Fred Ella archive uh, from Mara to Ella. And according to people who know, these the handwritten versions of them, she actually wrote. Later in life, Meru would write for Mara. But in the 50s and, and, and 60s, I think, um, Mara was actually writing her own letters, so there's quite a few actually just written by Mara that are very interesting. She had kind of a, a good pen pal friendship with Ella Winterfeld. And here's that example of, you know, in the Fred Ella collection, there's quite a bit of newsprint here and there. So this is actually a very long thing that we have to get creative in scanning, sometimes scan in two sections. And the one on the right, you can see that stain is where a folded up bit of newsprint used to be right against it. So it's interesting. 
And then here is this funny, you know, just weird little personal little things of, this is a caricature of Fred from 1945. <laughs> <laughs> so upcoming projects, um, aside from, you know, there's ongoing work with all of those, and I'll show you guys uh, a little slideshow of just some other photos, but, <clears throat> so, let's see here. So in the last year, we, we really focused in um, on the Fred and Ella Winterfeld uh, collection, which was, is on loan to us on behalf of Marshall Hayes Air. So this stuff was sitting here many years. I didn't know it. So Mimi and Ben, who's here, and uh, Molly gave us permission to kind of help them go through these many boxes of just stuff, including uh, a whole box of slide carousels, which I went through. And then just lots of papers, you know, for quite a long time, he was, Fred was sort of the group head of the New York group. So they, anytime there was a message for someone in New York, it would actually filter through them during these certain years, quite a bit of the 50s. So they would be expected, God, if only they had email, but they would be expected to retype a couple paragraphs, send that off to Beryl, or retype a little note and send that off to Adele, or, and so they were, they actually have pieces of what probably end up in other people's archives. Now sometimes, if you can believe it, those messages would come through Elizabeth here, and she would have to, or Kitty, would have to retype all the messages for the entire New York group and send them to Fred, who then <coughs> email would have to retype. So it's kind of like a phone tree, but through letters. What's great about that is, you know, some things have gotten lost over the years, and this was one way that there are copies of these things, portions of it. You know, you might find, even if somebody lost their things, it was a way that there were duplicates out there in the world. So I'm encouraged by that, actually. So this has been a great project because it, it has so many, it has photographs, it has slides, it has uh, a lot of paper, and it's given us a chance to really cut our teeth in learning all the ins and outs, and it's been a great help to have uh, Elaine Cox, who was trained in India, you know, with Meru and a lot of people about how they hold, and they had to just figure it out, you know, back way back in the day. And we, at a certain point, had about 11 different volunteers coming twice a week, and we were just doing different aspects of this, and it became a very good, tight working group. And um, <clears throat> so, other than that, we have recently been given from several vectors. Robert Dreyfus's archive just keeps coming to us for some reason, from ex-wives and friends and people who had his photos. And so we've got the biggest group of, of his correspondence and his photos of, of his time in India. Very large Swiss archive and manuscript of all his many trips there, which we only just looked at. We don't even know exactly what's in there. But apparently Bob spent a lot of time in Switzerland. <laughs> And um, we're working on and have been gathering 1969 Darshan photos. So we're hoping to have a nice slideshow for the upcoming year where I know there's going to be a number of celebrations for the 50th anniversary of the Darshan. Currently working on a little collaboration with Erwin Luck where um, he has a number of Super 8 films of interviews with the Mondale and people who met Baba in the early 70s. And these are, the, in some cases, the only known interviews of, of various people. Like, they died shortly after, before video came out. So we're just testing with a couple. But one of them is with uh, Francis Brabazon, which is very rare. There are very few interviews with Francis. And the other one is, uh, is one with Margaret Krask from about 70, 71. So. We've been gathering a very large, you know, getting a lot of Bob books, spiritual books. We have the, the beginnings of quite a large spiritual library. Um, <clears throat> very recent acquisition from uh, my father, Clive. He has been kind of saving this, this chair that Baba gave Darshan in 1956 at Hilda Fuchs' house. And so this chair is the one that's been at the, the LA Center since he first rescued it from getting thrown away in 1978, I think it was. Yep. So um, he's recently brought that to Asheville, and then the Sadra Mara gave him to found a new center, and he's been looking for this whole time to find a center that it felt right to give it to. So once our, our new building is, is finalized, we're going to have kind of a dedication and bring in the chair and the Sadra and kind of help 
charge the place right. Um, a lot of people ask me, well, what should I do? You know, I've got a couple things, but what can I do? And the things that we tend to ask people, if they have something that they feel is precious, maybe Baba related or letters or something that was passed on to them by perhaps somebody that met Baba and they've just been like, well, I'm not sure what I'm going to do with this. So what we often ask them to do is first, lay, you know, write out what it is. Like make sure it's not just sort of hidden under a weird drawer and, you know what I mean? Uh, label it. Through us, we can help you figure out what to put it in, like an acid-free box or plastic, whatever it is. But just write up the story. How did you get it? They call this provenance. Provenance means where did it come from? So if it was, well, this was given to uh, Mara and she gave it to me in 1973, then just that, you know, something like that. And, and if she said, oh, well, it, she said it was blessed by Bob, you know, or whatever the story is. Because later on, what we found is when somebody's kids who don't know much about Baba or Auntie Bethel shows up, this stuff can look a little bit like junk and then it gets thrown away. And so slides and negatives and sometimes precious things and correspondences have just gone in the trash because no one was overseeing uh, even, even just the spring cleaning, you know, let alone when someone passes away unexpectedly. So labeling it, writing it up in a will, like here's where I want it to go so that the name on the box matches the name in the will so that you know someone knows, oh yeah, this is supposed to go somewhere. Um, let's see. And if it's of an intellectual nature, you know, scan it now or have someone help you scan it. Find somebody and make sure a copy gets out there to an archive or all the archives if you want. You know, it doesn't really matter. Just make sure, because the real thing we're trying to prevent is loss from things like Flood, fire, accident, you know, just mishap. That can just happen. It's like happened to most of us about one thing or another. So deal with this while you're around. And, and maybe people have questions about, oh, what, did, what was the story behind this? And it's a lot easier to figure it out when people are alive than it is to guess about it, you know, years after the fact when people finally see it. So that, I think, concludes my time. Thank you very much. Greetings, everybody. First, I just wanted to, to thank everyone involved with uh, the circle of friends here and your board and for inviting us to come to, to share our uh, excitement about this project. It's, it's wonderful to be back here. Uh, Hugh and I had the opportunity to be here uh, in June, um, and unfortunately, circumstances were that there was a smaller group. So it was very nice to have a full house and really wonderful to, to see and feel what, what you all are doing here with, with Baba's help. It's a, it's a great great experience to be part of your, your group for the evening, so thank you for that. I'm slated to talk about the, the building to tell you what's, what's going on with this place that we, as Hugh described, managed by Baba's grace and turning of various keys to, to acquire. Before I do that, I'd like to just share a very brief personal story of how, how I got connected to archiving things, to the archiving project. And in the early, in the spring, we sent out some uh, communication to the, the bottle world, which some of you may have seen and some of you may have not, so I'm just very briefly going to mention it. And before, this is a small picture of the building, we have bigger ones to come. Um, but my personal story in connection with the archive starts with this person. Her name is Mamie Kramer. She lived in New York, and she's my grandmother. And she had the great fortune of meeting Baba here in Myrtle Beach in 1958, and was very involved with the New York group Monday night meetings. Um, I know that she was involved with sending medicine to India, knew that there was correspondence. No one else in the family was really interested in Mayor Baba, my parents in particular, so I didn't really hear much about it from her. I remember seeing his picture in her library, and to this day I regret, as a six-year-old, not saying, who is that? But that wasn't to be. When she died, her house was cleared out in New York, and no one knew what the Baba stuff was. It's a case that no one really knew about it. No one knew, no one cared, and I don't know what was lost. I know there were letters, I know there were, uh, I'm sure, photographs and other pre probably precious items. And that always stayed with me that this was, this was unfortunate. For me personally, in terms of the family connection, but in a broader sense. 
And when I heard uh, about this archive project as the group was starting to form, I came in a little bit after the beginning of it, I felt personally moved to try to do something to help prevent that sort of thing from happening again. So as Eric said, if you have things or family members have things, make a plan of some kind. Don't, don't, let, it, don't let it slip by. So you mentioned this building. It was formerly the Red Oak School. It was built in 1928 um, by a very well-known local uh, architect in the Asheville area. We also built the Jackson Building, one of the iconic Art Deco style buildings in downtown Asheville. Um, back then in 1928, schools were a priority for government spending. So they got the best architect. They got a prime piece of real estate. It's on six acres on the top of a small hill. Uh, natural ventilation and light and all sorts of benefits like this. And it was built really, really well. This is a fortress. It is, as Peter Nordin and Ty Bravasti have said, this, that this is a, uh, I guess the, the official archival or architectural term is a massive building. That means something very particular to architects. It's uh, basically a fireproof structure. It is made out of uh, cinder, uh, concrete blocks, ceramic blocks, brick, and uh, that's a view, uh, again, a small picture. It's a view from above, and I apologize, we have a couple of these really tiny pictures. That gives you a little bit better idea of the building. Um, there's two wings to it. One is, has classrooms on two floors, and the other one has a large uh, gymnasium. So I'm just going to go through these photographs. gives you an idea, a little bit of a tour for those of you who haven't been to the location. Again, I'm sorry, my technical skill isn't what Erich's is, is to perhaps make this picture nice and big. This is a picture looking at the gymnasium um, before we purchased the building. Um, and again, a few small pictures. This is a, one of the classrooms, original maple floors, 12-foot uh, ceilings with windows that go all the way to the ceiling for lots of natural light, double classroom. It also has a commercial kitchen that's still, still functioning. Um, this was a small uh, separate structure on their property. I'll come back to this in a couple of minutes to show you what's happened to it. Am I standing in anyone's way? Probably. A little bit, but we can uh, Okay. Well, I need to be here to push this button, unfortunately, so <laughs> sorry about that. Um, this is the beginning of some of the work that happened once we got a hold of the building. Um, I believe those legs belong to Peter Nordine. <laughs> he did. This was, this was one of those... Um, one of those Dorothy moments, you know, um, the man behind the red curtain in this case. So this, this stage had been walled off and an apartment had been behind it. They had a bunch of, of kids and teenagers and young 20 year olds or something who were there kind of camping out in the warmer months and going out and helping to rebuild people's houses. So this, the first thing we did was to open up the, open up the stage. Peter, and that's a view from up above looking down into the, the, uh, the, the gym space, the auditorium with, with its stage. This is a, a, when we looked at this, we weren't really going out of the way looking for a gymnasium. That wasn't on the plan. <laughs> but it came with the school. It's definitely attached. And uh, quite an extraordinary place for uh, public <coughs> events, for Bob events, music sahabas potentially, when the sound system is up to professional standards in a while. Volleyball. <laughs> and volleyball. There is, um, absolutely, that's on the list. So I'm just going to go, just to give you a little idea of walking around the place. This was the beginning of tearing some things down, taking off the sheetrock. Basically, what we've been doing pretty much up until now is what we call a discovery phase. What's really going on? So you've got to look, you've got to take some things apart to figure out what that is in order to know what you have to do next. This was a group of folks moving very heavy pipes, some of these pipes, about 1,000 pounds. Um, moving them out, um, they can, can be reused elsewhere, not necessarily in our building, um, but that was part of making it fit for the purposes that we have. Um, we have a number of folks here, including uh, Phil Ludwig and Jean, uh, along with Ken Blackman there in, in the middle. Again, just to give you some idea, the, the people helping out, since we started working on the building, we've had over 1,200 volunteer hours from a wide variety of people, people who were there cleaning windows and scraping paint, or in the case of Peter Nordine, doing very highly skilled work. Uh, he 
incredibly generously has, has donated his time, expertise, and uh, advice to the, to the project. And even while he's in India, is in regular contact via Skype and email. We have particular detailed questions to go over. So scaffolding up on the roof, little lunch break for the uh, for the people helping out. This is a classroom. Uh, we saw a picture a minute ago about a double classroom. This is that same classroom. Wow. One of the things we found out that we knew there was a problem with the floor because it had buckled and it had been repaired at some point in the past. I said, well, got to take a look at this and see what's going on. There had been some water infiltration from the outside, and it turned out that the floor had to come up. All of it, about 1,200 square feet. And it turned out that the subfloor had to come up as well because it had, over 90 years, some things had happened to it that had to be dealt with. So uh, again, this was done not entirely with volunteer labor, but very much cutting the, the cost. We've taken out the floor. We're going to have to lay a new, a new slab. So that's the kind of some of the things we're doing. This, for those of you who are interested in buildings, um, this is a picture of a ceiling. And what this shows you is that the, the floor structure is made in a, a way that isn't very common anymore. It's made with uh, steel joists and um, steel lath and concrete. It's incredibly sturdy. And this is it's also fireproof in terms of the, the break between the floors. Quickly to go through, this used to be a bathroom. This is one of the rooms that will be the archival storage uh, areas, completely fireproof, special uh, system for humidity and heat uh, control at, at all times. So just to, just to give you a little run through, again, more bathroom work. This is a kind of stuff that had to be torn up. Very heavy, heavy work in a, a lot of senses of the word. That's Jeannie uh, Felkner, Jean Nordine Felkner doing some acrobatics on the, the top of a ladder. Uh, <laughs> Carrying out heavy pipe and more bolt. Now this is an example of just you know being careful with materials. Peter Nordine is a fanatic about many things. Baba, first of all, but second of all, he's a fanatic about not wasting anything. For any of you who've ever done uh, work on your house or or contractors yourself, he has a three percent wastage on sheetrock. Anybody who knows about that kind of work, that's impossible. You have to have much more waste, but he manages, he saves screws out of old wood, and he reuses them effectively. So this is an insulation that's been taken out of the drop ceiling that's being kept to see if we might need it someplace else. More work opening up the inside of the roof. Work, one of the classrooms that's laid out as a, a work prep station, very well organized with equipment. Acoustic tiles that have been removed and are ready for other use. This is one of the old classroom doors. Again, this was built in 1928. Do you remember what kind of wood it is, Hugh? Do we know? Yeah, oak. Oak. Um, there's oak, there's hickory, there's lots of wood that we find used in the building. So this is one of Jeannie's projects of stripping, stripping the doors down to their uh, earlier state. You can see the floor of the classroom beyond. Hard work with wheelbarrows. Various other people working away, filling up a dumpster. This is our the gentleman who spoke first this evening out on a tractor. <laughs> this is a view of the attic. This building is, uh, has two stories in the classroom wing, and it has an attic. And it's not a small little attic. It looks like the inside of an ark. And it has the capacity, because the floor is of the quality I showed you in that earlier picture, it could be an entirely useful third floor of the building, expanding the square footage remarkably. It's not something we're about to jump into now, but there's potential for that. And so part of our work is to proceed in such a way that would not um, obstruct a future development, but to make arrangements now to enable that to be used um, for additional space in the future. <coughs> More attic shots. And here we have again. Peter Nordine cutting up a piece of pipe. Um, before he left for India, we had a little goodbye party for him, and uh, we had a t-shirt made up with this photograph on it and saying, quote, was it sparks flying from Mayor Baba? <laughs> and uh, 
This again, uh, a shot of our chairman at the, uh, expecting the roof. We were up on the roof taking a look at it. This is a hatch uh, up on the top there. So I'm going to briefly run you through what happened with this cottage, caretaker's cottage or a cottage on the property. Um, two bedroom recently redone inside with uh, HVAC, but otherwise uh, it needed some work. When we first looked at the property and it was being used by the, the former owners, I went in and looked at it. The guy was on site, I think he was probably the ex I think executive director. He was living there along with his three sons, aged like 14 to 20. I've heard the term man cave used, but I've never been in one quite like this. You could hardly move, there were video games and guns and all sorts of stuff in there. And that's kind of what was going on in this picture. Those, if you can't glimpse it, you've got to, there's a lot of stuff on the porch. And, um, so this is some of the crew under, largely under Jeannie's direction. Um, see Jean, Brene, Renee, Elaine, a variety of other folks here, who put lots and lots of hours into whipping this place into shape. Cleaning, scrubbing. Oh. Jean wouldn't like me showing that picture, but um, planting, <laughs> scrubbing some more, hands and knees, getting the paint off the floor finally. And what we're left with is what we call Mayher Cottage. And that's what it looks like now. And the actual financial cost to Mac was probably around $250. Time was donated, um, paint was left over from someone's house was donated, lots of time and effort. So this is part of how we're trying to, trying to work as best we can. And I tell you, it was an extraordinary experience just to see, to see the feeling, to feel the, the Baba energy of everyone coming <coughs> out when they could. Say, well, I can only spare an afternoon a week, but I really love coming here to help. And people working together on a project and you know, gathering for meals in the middle of the day, it was just, it was a real privilege just to feel, you know, to feel somehow connected to it. Um, and here's another picture of Jeannie, for those of you that know her. Um, yeah, a real tornado, absolutely, a tornado, the, Nor the Nordin family <laughs> Baba tornado, yes. Um, so, that's the last of the, of the photographs. I just wanted to say briefly, when I first heard about this particular property. I was out of the country, I think I was in, in Germany, and there were emails flying around amongst the, the Mac board, and I thought, no, this is crazy. <laughs> this is just a nice idea, but no, this, this is going to blow over fast before I get home. And it didn't. And I went and looked at it the first time, and the first time I visited, I still thought, man, this place is big. What's, you know, no, 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 no. This is just, just didn't see it. Um, but I was interested in other people's vision and enthusiasm. The second time I went out, I met Ty Provosti, the architect, who some of you may know, yeah. Ty. Um, yeah. He worked on the uh, Memorial Tower in Maribod and has done a lot of other projects. So it was on my second visit and I was walking around and I had quite an interesting experience. It's just not something that happens to me on a regular basis. I just all of a sudden could feel what was going to happen in this place. And it was amazing. It was just this baba full, dynamic, vibrant place with people coming from all over the world. And the activity of them being there was uplifting and creative. I was like, wow. And this, we hadn't put an offer on the building. And I didn't have, it wasn't one of those senses of, oh, I think this is what might happen here. It was different. I'm getting little chills to see even telling you this. It's like, this is what is going to happen here. And I held on to that through the, the process of our trying and succeeding to buy the building because it was such an impossible, a lot of people said, oh, it's a great idea, but you know, I hmm, don't think it's going to happen or, um, you know, I'll be happy to support you if and when you ever get this building, et cetera. And it did, and Bob, it turned, Bob absolutely turned the key. So I want to take a second now to just to t go over a little bit about what do we, what do we think is going to happen in this place. So in terms of what is our primary mission and how do we see this, uh, this amount of space playing into that or being used for it, I'm going to step out of the way. So if you want to try to read it, you, you can. Um, 
Certainly, um, storage for archive material, safe from water and fire. This building is ideal for um, the basis of an archive because of its construction, its location. Um, even though we're at this moment getting snowed on big time up there, uh, it's geologically safe. It's not going to get flooded. It's not going to burn down. There aren't likely forest fires, and even if there were fires near the building, the building's not about to burn down. Um, so that's the primary issue, and we have space allocated. Um, you saw those old bathrooms that are being turned into very uh, safe and secure places. That would be for, you know, once things are processed and are to be protected and safe. Um, and also area for doing archival work, the kind that Eric was talking about, the scanning, the rehousing, the evaluating, the cataloging. Um, we also want to have a focus on research and a, a lending library. One of the things that, maybe Eric, you already said this, but an archive is not a, not a hole in the ground that things disappear into. It should be a living, breathing, um, safe place, but one that has access, that is accessible, both in person and electronically as, as possible. Um, Ward Parks recently met with us. He comes to Asheville uh, with some regularity. And we talk with him about research and what he's done a lot of research in the archives in India. Some of that was a hard won uh, experience for him. And so we talked about what are the, what are the archival needs and what are the, the needs of a researcher and how can, we, how can we support that. So we envision seminars, we envision uh, gatherings of a variety of kinds that can happen in this space. Um, so administrative offices for Mayor Archive Collective are also part of the plan. Uh, we don't anticipate being top-heavy on administration, but we need to have some space to do that. We also want to have space for a quiet reflection and display space. So with Baba's chair, Sadra, or other precious items, to have an opportunity for people not just to know that it's in a box somewhere, but to have some access and in an atmosphere of, uh, of connection and, and reflection. Uh, the display area, self-led media uh, tours explaining what's there in a historical context. I mentioned educational seminar space, research again, performing arts assembly space. That that uh, gym auditorium is well suited for all sorts of uh, all sorts of events. Um, we're looking to get an acoustical evaluation of the space. It's huge, very high ceiling. Looking to do this on a get some help uh, to have that evaluated appropriately so that it can have um, the best quality sound and acoustics for performances. Um, Baba Bookstore on site as well. Um, game room, ping pong, room, board games. One of the things that is, I'm interested, you know, looking around the room here, with a couple of exceptions, there is a certain age band in the room. <laughs> or a band and then above that band. And one of the things that um, is apparent, and Eric has brought this to those, the rest of us working with this, this has to be inviting for everybody. And if you have kids, it's gotta be inviting for the kids, but the parents aren't gonna be able to come. So, but also that it's not all, it's not all seriousness and, and research and, um, you know, hours and hours of meditation, but it is, it's community and um, connection and fun along the way. And, um, so including, so therefore, playroom, playground of some kind, some facility to make it attractive for kids and therefore their, their parents. Small meeting rooms, audio production and processing studio. So not only for dealing with archival things that, that we may be entrusted with or asked to help with in the way of, of audio files, there's lots of cassettes out there, um, as well as other uh, tape media that need to be digitized and, and preserved before there is no longer a cassette player on the planet that we <laughs> can play them. Um, part of our vision also was to have a recording uh, facility so that people whose stories have not necessarily been recorded, can have an opportunity to come and have that, have that be part of, part of the record. Um, 
and guest housing accommodations. There is an apartment uh, as well as the guest ha the caretaker's cottage. The apartment uh, possibly could be used on a temporary basis for people who are visiting. We don't have a plan for a residential development, although um, you know the neighboring area and uh, as property becomes available, we already have a feeling that some people are, are you know maybe interested in, in moving. But that's a whole nother whole nother ball game. And last but not least, as someone has already mentioned, a volleyball court, <laughs> indoor or outdoor or, or, or possibly both. So um, that's all that I have to, to share with you.